Hello, everyone, and welcome to the virtual closing reception of Presence Erasure Black History in St. Augustine. I am Casey Wooster, the collections assistant of Governor's House Library. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And I'm Laura Marion, the collections coordinator at Governor's House Library. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Governor's House Library is located in St. Augustine, Florida. It is managed jointly by UF Historic St. Augustine Incorporated and the UF George A. Smathers Libraries with the mission of preserving and providing access to the historical resources that enhance our understanding and appreciation of St. Augustine's built heritage. Our most recent project is the exhibit Presence Erasure Black History in St. Augustine. On view in the Smathers Library Gallery, July 15th through August 31st, 2020. The exhibition traces the city's 450 plus years of Black experiences and stories. It examines the critical role Black St. Augustinians played in the development of St. Augustine, Florida, and the United States. The exhibition is largely drawn from across the UF George A. Smathers Library Special and Area Studies collections and Governor's House Library with contributions from Lincolnville Museum and Cultural Center and St. Augustine Historical Society. The artifacts on display include historical photographs, brochures, maps, and more documenting Black experiences in St. Augustine over the centuries. Represented in the exhibit are the Black communities and people of Fort Mose, Lincolnville, and West Augustine. Today, we are joined by Gail Phillips. Ms. Phillips currently serves as Executive Director of the Lincolnville Museum and Cultural Center, which is housed in the historic Excelsior High School. She began at the museum as a volunteer in 2015 and has been instrumental in its transformation and development over the past five years. Under her leadership, the museum has established a regular schedule of operations, curated new exhibits, developed coalitions with other institutions. Phillips, a Jacksonville native, graduated from Wilson Senior High School, Florida Junior College, and the University of Florida School of Journalism. She is also a graduate of the First Coast Technical Institution Culinary Program. She brings business and former journalistic skills to grant writing, exhibit curation, and museum management. She introduced live jazz performances and a Living Legends Recognition Program as part of the museum's offerings. Historic preservation of the Excelsior High School Museum is among the projects she has spearheaded. That final project will be in excess of $1.75 million at completion. She currently serves on the St. Augustine Lighthouse and Maritime Museum and the St. Augustine Historical Society's Boards of Directors. Phillips lives in St. Augustine with her husband of 35 years, Floyd, who also serves as president of the museum's board of directors. Before we throw it over to our speaker, we have some light housekeeping to take care of first. The UF Libraries acknowledges that for thousands of years, the area now comprising the state of Florida has been and continues to be home to many native nations. We further recognize that the main campus of the University of Florida is located in the ancestral territory of the Potano and the Seminole peoples. Beyond the Gainesville campus, the UF Library serves many locations statewide that occupy the ancestral and present homelands of the Ace, Appalachie, Calusa, Creek, Miccosukee, and Yamazazi, as well as many other Native peoples who lived in this region since time immemorial. We acknowledge our obligations to honor the ancestral, present, and future Native residents and cultures of Florida. Secondly, we'd like to inform you all that we are recording the webinar and, and it will be available to watch soon. You'll notice that audio, video, and chat features are disabled. This is intentional to keep the focus on our speaker today. We encourage you all to submit questions throughout the pro program through the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. We will provide time at the end to answer as many questions as possible. Thank you, Casey. Thank you, Laura. I am uh, Regina Gail Phillips, and I am the director here at the Lincolnville Museum and Culture Center. Thank you for joining us this evening for this program. I hope we can share a little bit of the heritage of the Lincolnville and St. Augustine community as it relates to um, African-American heritage. 
And as you see here, we cover at the length of your museum, 450 plus years of African-American heritage. As a matter of fact, the city is getting ready to celebrate its 457th anniversary this coming September. And we do have African heritage going all the way back to that day. So come to Lincolnville and check us out and you'll see some of these stories close up. I wanna take the time also to thank Casey and Laura for putting together this exhibit. It has been um, really a, a great honor to have Lincolnville and the St. Augustine African American History featured at the University of Florida in the um, Smathers Library. So thank you ladies for putting it together and for sharing the history of this area with uh, the other people from the state of Florida and hopefully with a lot of students who will learn about us and uh, be interested in coming to visit us in the future. Next slide, please. So Lincolnville is established in an area, a Southeast Peninsula of, of St. Augustine. It was an area that was formerly Orange Groves. And before that, of course, as Casey shared with the map, it was Native American land. But there was an orange grove here and the area was settled by um, men and their families coming back from the Civil War who were part of the United States Colored Troops. And this is an old uh, photo actually from uh, a, a historic journal and it was called Africa, a little Africa. And Little Africa was really the name given to a lot of freedmen towns that were established after the Civil War. And it was not always an endearing name. So the people later changed the name to Lincolnville in honor of President Lincoln um, who had um, signed the Emancipation Proclamation and who was also assassinated before um, he was able to finish his term in the presidency. The next slide shows you that there was one man. Next slide, please. And this is a picture of, I called him Satiki because that's what his mother named him, but he was enslaved, brought to America and his name, given name here was Jack Smith or Uncle Jack. And so he was listed in the 1866 census for St. Johns County. And he was the only person listed there um, who gave Africa as his play, place of birth, I'm sorry. And I just wanted to show you this because a lot of the history of St. Augustine is actually captured in his book that was researched based on um, a transcript that was left in the papers of Buckingham Smith, which has a, a, a big tie to Florida. And it's in this Florida land of flowers and tropical scenery because Buckingham Smith actually wrote a lot about the flora and fauna of Florida, um, um, mainly starting in the Keys, but he was a part of uh, U.S. emissary to uh, Mexico and to Spain. And this man, this is a hard thing for me to say. He inherited Jack Smith. That's an awful thing to say about another human being. But his father had purchased this a young man and he grew up in his family and he died here in St. Augustine in the late 1800s. But um, this photo is actually from the Library of Congress. Can we go to the next slide, please? So Lincolnville as a community actually um, would not be what it is without this building you see on the right. And that's where the Lincolnville Museum is housed inside the Excelsior High School. This building was built in 1925. The class picture you see is going back to 1933. And a lot of these people became teachers and um, leaders in the community. So if you fast forward, it was their children who became a part of um, the, the struggles during the civil rights movement. And a lot of them supported it in a lot of different ways as well. But uh, a lot of their histories are here in the Lincolnville Museum, as well as at the University of Florida, the Samuel Parker Oral History Project, which we'll talk a little bit more about later as well. If we move on to the next slide, please. So the Excelsior Museum, and this is important to tell in the story of Lincolnville because the museum covers a lot of history, but it's only because this building was, was saved from demolition. 
as I said, it was built in 1925, but before there was this Excelsior High School building, there was a public school here known as public school or colored school number two, going back as early as 1902. And this area had three schools. It had a Catholic school, which is St. Benedict de Moore, which is also under, undergoing some historic preservation at this time. And then you had another school across the street, which was known as the Cooper School, which was a Presbyterian parochial school, which was a boarding school for Black students that um, came to the area. In 1959, the high school here closed and it became an elementary school and junior high school again because a second Black high school was built, known uh, as Murray, which was built in West Augustine area of uh, St. Augustine. In 1968, this school closed along with a lot of other schools throughout the country because of um, the end of segregation. And so rather than integrate a lot of the African-Americans or black schools, they were closed. And so this school was closed and eventually slated for demolition. And in 1979, the community came together and said, this is a part of our heritage. We don't wanna see it destroyed. Let's turn it into something that the community can use. So it was saved. And eventually it became county offices for a lot of different services to the community as well as housing and uh, county welfare offices, state offices were in here as well. And then uh, in 1998, uh, a, a man from this community had the idea that it should become an African-American museum. And that man's name was Moses Floyd. And so he started a museum here. It was not extremely successful, did not last for very long. And eventually a, a board was formed called the Friends of Excelsior that uh, carried on the African-American museum tradition. They started an exhibit that um, when they actually opened to the public, they um, gathered artifacts from people throughout the community, photographs, and came up with an exhibit called The Way We Were. And then in 2012, the name of the organization was changed from Friends of Excelsior to Friends of Lincolnville. That's how we got the Lincolnville Museum and Culture Center. So that's a brief history of how we got to be the Lincolnville Museum and Culture Center. Next, please. This just shows um, that Lincolnville is a historic district recognized by the National Park Service and the National Registry. Uh, the school here was a big part of the anchor for that project, um, the application that went in in 1991. And what you'll be seeing going forward is how the building that was slated for demolition has been recycled and is being used today for uh, what is becoming a very vibrant community center as well as a, as a museum of uh, national importance. Next, please. So like I said, we are a local museum of national significance. The stories that we tell cover a long, a long span of time. So you're talking about centuries, like four and a half centuries. It's a lot to cover. The, the size of this building is 18,000 square feet. So we can't possibly tell all those stories in a way that you know we could put all the pictures on the wall so we have stories here from the earliest of times. We have stories about emancipation, about civil rights, about black um, explorers and conquistadors and um, a lot of other things in between. Next, please. So these are just a few of our exceptional stories going across the centuries. Uh, Lincolnville is home during the Reconstruction period for more than uh, a dozen uh, elected officials. And those elected officials, the Reconstruction period actually ended in 1877, but up until 1902, the last Black was elected to our city government here in St. Augustine, John Pepino. And his um, office ended very tragically when he was shot in the face by a um, sitting city marshal who did not like the idea of a black man asking him a question about the cost of uniforms for the police force. We also had in Lincolnville, inside the Palace Market, which was owned by a local businessman, uh, Frank Butler, our own um, voting precinct here within the Lincolnville community. 
that no longer exists today. There were a number of civil rights demonstrations that didn't just start in 1964 when Dr. King and Jackie Robinson came here. They came here because the civil rights movement was already underway and that they were able to utilize the publicity that they could get from here to propel it more into the national forefront. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. And you see some of that in the um, exhibit itself, if you've had the pleasure of seeing it in person, because even the cover um, story is about Dr. King being here on the streets of Lincolnville on Washington Street. And of course, um, Jackie Robinson also came and they were here also recognizing the St. Augustine Four, which we um, highlight in our museum as well. And these were young people who participated in sit-ins at our local Woolworth um, department store. And um, also the stories of people who did wait-ins and swim-ins and a lot of these stories and their headlines were international, not just national, but it also, uh, we, you can talk to people who were here during that time and they will tell you that St. Augustine was very pivotal in the signing of the 1964 Civil Rights Bill. Next slide. So I said, as, as um, Laura was sharing with you, I came to this museum as a volunteer in 2015. And the museum was here, it was open. It did not have regular hours did not have um, you know, any real support. And this is kind of what I found. But there, inside these cabinets, there were a lot of stories, a lot of photographs, a lot of content, very little design, very little interpretation of those stories. So unless you had a lot of time to spend reading and not even that so much as um, having somebody to tell you the stories, I was fortunate enough that Mr. Mason, Otis Mason, was on the board here at the time and he shared stories and Dr. Dorothy Israel was on the board. And then we had David um, Stroman who had grown up in this community. So they shared these stories with me and then I was able to go and do research and we had other interns and other people do research, but this is what I found. And so if we go to the next slide, you'll see that one of the first things that we did was to reorganize the content and design of the museum. And over the years, we've done a lot of different iterations of this. We've, we've changed it quite a few times in order to interpret the stories in a way that somebody would not have to have a guided tour in order to just come and, and share in this history. And you'll see as we go through that a lot of those have changed over time. So we can go to the next slide, please, Casey. And um, this picture is just to show you that in those years from 2000, I'm saying 16, because that's really when I got involved. I came as a volunteer and I walked in and my word was like, wow, this place needs help. And I didn't know that I would be the help that it would need, but I've been the help um, for the last seven years and uh, with a lot of people joining forces with us. And so St. John's County School District is a part of um, our help. Flagler College, our um, interns and other student volunteers have been a part of our program. We partner with the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program through UF. Uh, the Florida Historic Preservation Network is a network that actually um, is a coalition of African-American museums from throughout the state of Florida. There are about 39 museums and that network helps to bring capacity building in, in, in terms of educational programs. It offers stipends for interns. It also offers a, a small grant that we're able to use to help with um, some items that we're able to purchase um, for the museum. So that has been a major help. The Gullah Geechee Historical Preservation Corridor is also one of the ones we've partnered with over time that's helping us to bring more understanding of that part of the African-American um, history. The Institute of Museum and Library Services has been a major, major help. And I just shared this a week ago when I was down in Miami at the African American Association of African American Museums and got to talk to some of the people from IMLS. It was the grant that we got from IMLS when we were sitting here as a museum with no visible means of support. 
no income streams, not much going on, that we wrote a grant with the help of the African American Preservation uh, Network to the Institute of Museum and Library Services and were awarded uh, a $250, $250,000 grant matching grant, which we had to match half of it and we're trying to figure out how we're going to do it, but we made it happen. You know, our board members stepped up and they contributed. And so that really helped people to recognize there's something going on at the Lincolnville Museum that if they're getting national attention, it just, I say it gave us street cred in the museum business. So that's the way I like to look at it. And then later that year, we wrote another grant to the National Park Service, this time for preservation of the Excelsior Building. And we were able to um, get another grant from them for $500,000 for um, some of the restoration work that we've been able to do to this building. Another partner is the St. John's County Tourism Development Council. And um, we were able to do grants, which we use to reorganize our exhibits, which you'll see some of that coming up. And then the University of North Florida Digital Humanities Program has also been very instrumental in helping us with interns that could work on specific research projects that we've been able to do to add to our um, interpretive uh, stories uh, for the museum. The next slide, please. So as you can see here, one of our early partners was the University of Florida Samuel Proctor Oral History Project. And this is Dr. Paul Ortiz actually conducting a workshop inside our what we call our um, Excelsior room, which is a, little, is a multifunction space on the second floor of the museum. And this was back in 2017. And there were people who came from all over the community and some, you know, uh, from surrounding communities to participate in that workshop. And um, so it was really a very successful day long um, workshop that he did here at the museum. And we also had students from SPOP that came that summer and they actually spent the summer doing, collecting oral histories from people in the Lincolnville community. And they weren't just about civil rights, they were about people telling their stories. And just so um, that was the beginning of that partnership, which really helped us with building our oral history program. And we are using some of those same histories as we put together our virtual exhibits today. Um, and so they have been a good partner for us over the years. And it, on the next slide, what you'll see are some of the um, things, you know, in that short period of time, those partnerships and how they really helped us with capacity building. You know, the first thing we did, we changed the layouts of uh, the exhibits. We added to our board members and um, in terms of new board members with, with, with um, different um, insight, we added a regular schedule of operation for the museum added an admission fee. We added that um, Institute of Museum and Library Services um, capacity building and the National Park Service grant to what we were doing and joined Falcon. And we also attended our first AAAM conference. And I'm gonna tell you why that's important is because it helped me not coming from a museum background to see that there are so many African-American museum professionals and professionals, museum professionals working in African-American museums. They're not all African-Americans, but it showed me that this is really um, a viable uh, museum and that it deserves its place on the national scene. So I have been talking about the 450 year history of uh, St. Augustine and Lincolnville to everybody that will listen to me. And I think that the message is finally getting out that our history predates 1619 story and all the other stories. So we're getting heard and we're getting some recognition. Let's move to the next slide. And what I wanted to talk about is just how we had to look at what we had because we knew we had all this history, but how do you tell these stories? You can't just say, oh yeah, we did this and you know, just throw it up against the wall and, and see how it fits. We actually had to break it down into categories. So in 2019, we were able to hire a curator um, for a museum project and uh, she helped us and we used our interns as well. And we came up with several different categories and we've kind of divided our museum up into these categories. If you came today, 
you could walk through and you could actually see how it transitions through some of these um, various areas within the museum. And then of course, on the next slide, you see we had to, in order to make this happen and continue to, um, to grow, we had to build coalitions with, with partners and we strengthened all those relationships with all the uh, academic community that was close by. We really lean into the historical society who was the maintainer or the custodian for many of our local photographs that we display in our museum, museum um, the Richard Twine photographs, which uh, you see some of them in the exhibit as well. But he was probably the uh, foremost um, person to capture the 1920s part of the Lincolnville history through the emancipation parades, as well as he did a lot of uh, studio photography, portrait type photography. So we've utilized those partners in many different ways to, to build that story. And I wanna keep moving because I, I don't want us to run out of time before we see um, some of the other things I wanna share with you. So we'll go re re relatively quickly over the next few slides. These are some of the programs that we built to highlight um, what we do. So the people here are living legends. This was our first program where here again, Mr. Mason is in the center here and we honored him. And we honored um, Miss Janie Price, who's on the left. Miss Janie was a friend of Dr. Martin Luther King and he spent time at her house doing his stay here in Lincolnville during the 1960s. The man uh, in the orange tie is Jimmy Jackson, who was nearly lynched by the KKK here in uh, St. Augustine, along with Dr. Haling and two other men. And Dr. Dorothy Israel, who wasn't born here, her husband was a graduate of the Excelsior, but she has really been a great historian to this um, museum over the years. And she is 98 and she's still a part of our museum board, believe it or not. And then Mrs. Murders Mason, who's in the uh, wheelchair and she's the wife of Otis. And um, she was also a teacher here at Excelsior, um, undergraduate and a teacher and if we move on to some of the other programs, you'll see that those things that we did, uh, they actually helped to bring community into the Lincolnville Museum because we knew that jazz was a part of the culture and culture is something that will bring people out of the house who won't necessarily just come to see the museum. But if they come and see the uh, culture, a lot of them come back to the museum. So, um, uh, the next slide just shows you that um, our programming really attracted new audiences. And then the next one will show you that the facility itself started to attract other groups who were coming in and doing, um, utilizing the facility. So on the left, there was a play that was um, called um, Sweet, Sweet Emmeline about a woman who grew up here. Her name was... Um, Emmeline Mosby, she left and went to New York and became, you know, an, an international performer. And um, then, of course, we had Tea with Zora and Marjorie that was also performed here on our stage. And so we just continued to um, grow that part of what the museum offering was. And uh, even a local TV show that was produced here um, earlier this year and a lot of other commemorative events that we've had over the years. And um, the next slide is um, just showing some of the other events that we had, different exhibits. All of these things were helping to bring recognition to Lincolnville Museum. All of these are our own exhibits, except the one on the Harlem Renaissance, which was a um, virtual, our first virtual exhibit back in 2018. And it came with ocular headsets and everything and we got front page coverage. So that bought a lot of attention. And then we did the Make and Do, which was a Gullah Geechee exhibit, which bought out a lot of people who were interested in learning about that culture. And on the right, Women Who Made a Difference, which is still running here in the museum, is a virtual exhibit inside of a kiosk. So we we're able to share a lot more stories that way. So even the artifacts that we have and some of the ones that we don't own, we we're able to display. It's an interactive and it has the stories of those five women we were adding to it. Uh, one new uh, person uh, within the next month that's going up on. And so 
it continues to attract people when um, it has some of the oral history uh, clips that are in it and all kinds of other documents and stuff that are in there. And you know, our latest uh, addition on the left-hand side is the section of Woolworth counter that um, was from uh, formerly um, used by the St. Augustine for, but it was a part of a local bank that donated um, uh, well, the bank doesn't own it. The, the person that owns it, you know, donated it to the use of the museum. And so we also used it as part of our Juneteenth um, ceremonies when we did the unveiling of that exhibit. Let me just show you a little bit more um, on the next few slides, or actually we're going to go through those. If, if you can just see the uh, historic churches, and then the next one is going to show you a little bit of civil rights room. Uh, I think we have a couple on civil rights. And then um, the, it's just showing that those exhibits created new interest and interest by youth because they could see those pictures and we started to get more youth groups coming in. And we were doing, um, you know, like sometimes just small groups that we would do behind the scenes, like early morning tours, or sometimes they were kind of like reward tours for different groups, like from the Boys and Girls Club who had achieved certain, um, goals within those organizations. And it was a treat for them to come and, and be able to talk with us one-on-one -on -one about what we were doing. Uh, if we move to the next slide, I can tell you that all of this brought more recognition to the Lincolnville Museum and Cultural Center. Uh, we also had the historic preservation that was going on um, kind of simultaneously with us building up all our exhibits and stuff. And then the next thing that we're doing is overhaul of our archives and development of an archival system that's still underway. Uh, the next slide will actually show you, when I say archives, you, you guys who work at UF will probably say, what a joke. But for us, it's a really, really big deal because where the petition, petition line is that you can see in the floor on the picture on the left, that space to the right of that used to be the totality of our archive space. So we've expanded that space and then we've added two additional rooms where we can store oversized archives because we do have quite a, a few of those as well. And then um, the next slide just shows you while we were going through all of this, as everybody else in America experienced a shutdown because of a pandemic, and that created all kinds of problems for us as well. The um, other problems that we had was that moving the things that were already in these spaces while we were trying to do construction created a challenge because we didn't have the funding. As I said, we only had a $500,000 grant from the National Park Service. And so we had to do a whole lot of creative things to make that work. And one was moving things from one space to the other while interior spaces were being uh, renovated. And so um, this is just to recap some of the things that we did even during the shutdown, we were able to come back in 2022 and um, you know have some live shows uh, for our jazz. And at the end of 2022, was the greatest thing that we've had to date, which was to raise $250,000 in six weeks to get an additional preservation grant for this building. Um, the next slide will actually show you a few of the virtual kind of things that we had to pivot to because of the COVID shutdown. It forced us to look at alternative ways to attract people to the museum. And so it, you know, it, it turned into a positive like I said, the kiosk, which was originally was going to be an in-person exhibit. So you see the sketches to um, to uh, in the, sort of in the center uh, behind the woman that's looking at the kiosk. Those were done by a Flegler student. And that was going to be kind of like the cover for the uh, exhibit. And then we're going to expand on that. But after um, COVID, we started looking at, OK, how can we do it if we just have to do it virtually? So we came up with this kiosk even though it's not um, virtual, it, it is digital. And so people can come into the museum and it also saves because we don't have a lot of, um, a, a large footprint in order um, to be able to tell a lot of stories. So it was really um, good in a lot of ways. But the other thing we did, we started to do programs, you know, basically virtual programs like what we're doing here today. 
And those um, continued. We had quite a few of those. Um, you can go to the next one. We created a, a, a virtual exhibit. Um, one of our team members um, uh, created a virtual tour of uh, Frank Butler and his whole um, story, how he helped to create a black beach here in St. Augustine and as a business person here. And then um, we did a series of lectures in the next one about um, the history of Lincolnville and, you know, from starting from um, Watch Night and going through some of the civil rights stories. And uh, on the next one, you will see, I think we come back to Women Who Made a Difference. I like this, I like the graphics, but it was a really cool digital and we, we featured these five women and we were adding another one to that story um, as I speak, that's being produced right now. So we'll move on to the next slide. It is actually just telling us a little bit about how the museum over time has had to continually do capacity building and one of the things, which is, I think, responsible for us having the exhibit that you have been fortunate enough to view, if you've been able to make it to the Smathers Library, is a story about, um, you know, Black presence and, and the history of St. Augustine. After George Floyd's um, murder, it actually generated interest in African-American history museums and all kinds of stories. And you guys lived through it, you know, that there was a lot of interest. And so we have here in St. John's County, uh, an archive club, and it's people from different places like Casey and Laura and, you know, Flagler College and the Historical Society and all the different history museums. Uh, including the National Park Service at the Castillo, and, and we all come together. And so we were meeting virtually. And one of the um, things I was like sharing was like, um, they were asking, what can we do to make a difference? And I said, share stories from your archives about African-Americans that you have that is within the scope of your mission. And I think Casey and Laura have been at the forefront along with Kimberlyn, Elliot, who's no longer a part of my team, you know, she just recently moved to Tallahassee to become a curator at the Florida History Museum. But they worked diligently and put together a, a, a website called Resilience. Um, and it's about 450 years of African-American history in St. Augustine. And they also put together a, a Facebook page and a calendar that covered every day. So people were able to contribute history for a whole year and we all did programs and it just really helped to highlight the stories of African-Americans in the St. Augustine area. So I wasn't the lone voice, at least I felt like I was a lone voice for a long time, but I wasn't anymore. There were other people who were doing it and listening and um, we um, had a resilience fest last year and um, we will be hosting that again in February. So if you're in St. Augustine, in February, on February 18th, please come and join us for that because it's a lot of fun and a lot of history at the same time. But the other things that we were doing during that time also was interest was growing. Um, St. John's Cultural Council got more involved, the Visitors and Convention Bureau, TDC, all of these things were helping the, not just the Lincolnville as a museum, but St. Augustine Black history. And that's what's really important that this history is no longer um, like just being ignored, that it is being acknowledged and it is being highlighted in ways that it has never been before in the history of this city, even though it's the oldest city in, in the country. Um, I've also been engaged in community conversations, which is another way to just talk about, you know, civil unrest and, 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 and equity and diversity in the community. And, We've had good response with that. We've had city officials and county officials and people from all walks of life who participated in that as well. One of the other things I wanna go back, um, the next slide goes back to um, show you some of the things that resilience, the kind of things that they were doing. So it wasn't just a website, but it's like hosting programs and co-hosting programs all over the city. And this is one called Washing Away History that uh, featured um, you know, some of our local archeologists and historians, uh, or I should say national archeologists and historians who have spent time working at Fort Mose and talking about the changing tides and the high water um, impacts of um, rising tides at Fort Mose and um, uh, 
than the um, family fest that was held. I want to just kind of um, go through a few more. And um, on the next slide, Casey, is a few more of the kinds of programs that um, help to really, I think, give the African American history of St. Augustine a little more acknowledgement. So we did a program last year with um, that was sponsored in part by the uh, St. Augustine, um, City of St. Augustine Library and the Cultural Council and Flagler, Count, uh, Flagler College. And so I had an opportunity to participate in that and share the 200 year history uh, for the county, not for the city of St. Augustine, but for St. John's County, African-American history. So you can't share 200 years without telling some of the older stories. So we were able to do some of that. And of course there was someone uh, representing the minority history and then, um, you know, the uh, Anglo history as well as uh, Christina from our cultural council um, talked about where we're going from here. And she has been working to tell these stories and, and bring them to the forefront about African-American history in St. Augustine and St. John's County. So I think that we're in a better place than we've ever been in terms of sharing those stories and, and making sure that that history is not buried and lost ever again, because um, now, as they say, the genie is out of the bottle and she's not going back. Uh, can we go to the next slide? This is uh, going back to um, our own personal story here at the Lincolnville Museum. This is me with Caroline Davis, who is my museum assistant here. And this is a part of what we've done in terms of preservation and renovation for our front, which used to be a hodgepodge old desk and you know things that um, we just tried to create something that made people feel welcome. So we were able to build a new reception area also in the museum on the first floor. I wanna tell you a little bit more about the internal things that are happening in the museum because that's just as important as telling the stories because you can tell stories all day, but you have to be able to have an operation and procedures that will help you to do that. So, you know, our team and, you know, we've had uh, a lot of help over the years. We have a lot of volunteers that come and work with us every single week, which has made a big difference too, but having um, some leadership to help make those things um, happen. So um, we have an archive access project that is underway. We have a new volunteer handbook and policy manual. We, um, we have also been able to put together information about our concession operation and put together uh, videos that help to train the volunteers for that. Because as we grow as a museum, one of the things that's important is to have volunteer logs. Um, and um, so I'm going to um, go on to the next couple and we're almost done here because um, I want to give you a chance, guys, guys a chance to answer some questions. So um, like I said, we're working on our archives. This is one of our interns working um, on the archives behind the scene. And um, so one of the things that we have is a lot of things that we wanna be able to be good stewards of those things. So we're trying to go to best practices. We were able to hire an archivist this, this past year, well, this year that she's with us now through a National Endowment for Humanities grant, which we're hoping we can keep her because it's a project that will take a, much more than a year. And she is actually in the process of cataloging items and um, preparing them for digitization and creating a system that so we will be able to find where all of our things are, all of our artifacts, all of our photographs, everything that we own, everything that you know we may have borrowed from somebody else, where they came from. So all of those things are becoming a part of our system here at the museum. And I think I have one last informational slide. And this is just kind of a recap of what's happened here. Um, I'm not gonna read all of this to you, but these are some of the things that we've gone through over the last few years. And um, so that's kind of like it in a nutshell. And um, there's one more, if you go to the next one, it um, just shows you what I've said already, that these are the two things that are underway right now. We have a new preservation project that is just getting underway and our new archives program that is underway 
And these are some of our um, funders for that. The next page is just a list of all the different partners and um, grantors that we've been able to um, put together over the last five or six years. And um, we got two more pages. And one is just the people on my team who helped me put this together. And uh, as I mentioned, Caroline is my museum assistant. Mike Kanapaki is my graphic design guy who went through and made sure that all of my eyes were dotted and T's were crossed and that I had the same fonts and some uniformity to this presentation. And I have to give credit to Deborah Henderson from the University of Florida um, um, Oral History Program, who you saw some of her photographs in there. She probably recognized them if she saw them, but you saw some of her work there. Um, and then we have some photos that were um, staff photos and some that were from LMCC archives. And the last slide is actually from our history, uh, an old Spanish government house, uh, the old Spanish government house, which I say is Casey and uh, Laura's home. And um, that's where they worked here at the UF government house. And that's what it was like in 1835. So thank you for, um, your attention. I hope you learn a little bit about the Lincolnville Museum. We are here. We're open Tuesdays through um, Saturdays from 1030 a.m. until 430 p.m. We are available for group tours. There are opportunities for interns. There are opportunities for volunteers and members and a lot more. So please reach out to us. Our website is lincolnvillemuseum.org. And uh, you could, or you can email us at lmccstaug. That's lmcc st. Aug at gmail.com. Thank you. Thank you, Gail. And we'll make sure to get all that information out in an email so everyone has it. Um, if we just want to go to full screen now, thank you. Um, we have some really awesome questions. Thank you guys for hanging in there. Just a few more minutes. I'm going to start. Our first one is, what type of support is needed going forward? Great question. Obviously, always uh, financial is at the top of the list. Um, you know, we hope that by the time we come around to the centennial for the Excelsior that we will have some kind of endowment in place. Obviously, we don't have that now. Right now, we have to compete with grant writing with everybody else through the TDC and the Florida um, Department of State and IMLS and all the other organizations that will give us money. So, um, you know, but we do have membership. We accept donations and, you know, we, we accept support in any form, um, you know, that's in, um, in agreement with our, um, mission, you know, we uh, obviously, you know, we have to operate within the standards of being a nonprofit entity and, and doing everything according to the rules and regulations. And so that's, I hope I answered that. <laughs> that is a great answer. Um, next question, are field trips organized to the museum and cultural center from the local schools? You kind of touched a little bit on that in your presentation, but I thought you'd like to elaborate. Yeah, since um, 2020, when COVID, we were having quite a few field trips from different schools, not as many, even from St. John's County as from other counties. We had field trips from Orlando and Dade County and, and, and different places, Duval County. We did do a virtual program for the school system in Orange County, not Orange County, in Orange Park, which is Clay County here. Uh, and so we do have some schedule for the fall, but it's been slow coming back. That's been one of the slow areas of getting students back in the house. And um, so that's that's still a challenge for us. Thank you. Okay, next one. Lots of partners and financial grants, yes. But um, no mention of the city of St. Augustine. Has there been any active involvement of COSA, C-O-S-A, in the development running of the museum? Not since I've been here, um, you know, not that we have not been reaching out and um, trying. As, as a matter of fact, we have, um, we did have some, we have some support from the city in 
uh, in kind kind of things that they do. They're not as readily, um, you know, willing to give out dollars. We just got support. As a matter of fact, check came in the mail today from uh, St. John's County for um, the pledge that they made towards our historic preservation. And so, um, and we get grants from them, but the city doesn't really have a, a, any um, direct support that they have given to this museum other than, you know, for programs and stuff like that, that, you know, we were able to say, um, it's been more in kind, I think, than, um, monetary there's no ongoing monetary um, support this is a two-part question oh, okay. um, <laughs> lincolnville character is changing again is cosa cosa doing anything to preserve the historic neighborhood and community well uh remind me what cosa is um I'm not quite sure it's, myself. It's, it's City of St. Augustine. Oh, okay. Thank oh my you. gosh. <laughs> it's like, that's an acronym. I had a whole mouthful, but I couldn't Yeah, remember. I haven't seen that one before. So what they are doing, they have a Lincolnville CRA. And the Lincolnville CRA in the city has um, uh, recently, and I can tell you as recently as just a few months ago, they conducted walking tours through Lincolnville to look at the architecture and see what was in line with um, traditional architecture. Because when Lincolnville was first became uh, original application for Lincolnville as a historic district, it had the largest number of Victorian homes of anywhere in St. Augustine. And of course it has lovely oak trees that were planted during the reconstruction period. Um, and the streets were laid out during that time. So it's a small quaint streets for the most part. But the city does not have at this point, they're trying to come up with, they don't have a standard, they're just trying to come up with some kind of guideline, which is from what I understand, the standard is like, this is what you have to do, a guideline is like, you may do this. And so a lot has happened already when there was no kind of guideline or anything. So you have all these different kinds of new structures that have been built in Lincolnville that has added to the funding that's available to the CRA, which they have been able to use for some um, preservation of some historic buildings, not this museum has not been on their list, but other buildings um, and other homes that they, they've been able to help. But um, the, the newer homes and the newer price tags that go with those have driven up the, um, the tax base. So they're able to use those funds from that to put into the CRA fund for uh, rehabilitation of long-term residents and for historic sites within the community. Thank you. And that, well, I guess I learned something new today, what CAOSA is. <laughs> well, so next question. Will some or all of the archival material be available online for research? Eventually, um, we are, like I said, we're just starting on that project. We hired, um, uh, our archivist started in March. And then we had, um, you know, Caroline started on the project last June. And her job was to kind of like assess what was here. And um, so we're working on a handbook just so that like procedures, basically, because you got to have a procedure before you can say this is what I have. So the cataloging um, is just um, another way of saying this is what we have. And the next step will be digitizing, which will be hopefully through another grant that we will need to write this fall. So if you hear that people, she's looking for a volunteer grant writer. I'm just gonna put that out there for you, Gail. Or just money. <laughs> or just money. That's always great too. Yeah. Okay, we're almost done. Where do we stand in terms of the renovations of the, they say physical plant, but I think they mean your building. Yeah, so um, phase one, we did a lot of exterior stuff, basically just to um, stop, the, stop the bleeding is one way of putting it, but it was a lot, we had a lot of places that uh, needed to be repaired that were kind of decaying on the exterior. And we were able to do that. 
So we're just starting on phase two and phase two is with a, a grant from the Florida Department of State for African-American history and culture that um, we were just awarded. So we're just starting um, with um, contractual agreements with that and, and setting that up. And so for that, we are gonna return to the barrel tile roof that was on the building uh, originally. We have funds in there to um, put in a new elevator and to make the building more energy efficient. So we're just taking, you know, a 1925 building and making it 2025 ready. Nothing, you know, fancy, just, um, you know, um, strengthening the bones um, of the building itself. And we will have some technical things that we add um, so, you know, we've, we continue to fundraise to do a lot of the interior things that we will need to do to make that happen as well. So, um, it's, it's starting, it's just a slow process. It's, it's like, um, you want it to happen like yesterday, but sometimes just getting it underway. Once the construction starts, it goes pretty rapidly, but all of the things that you have to get in place, all the paperwork and, um, it takes quite a bit of time. And so that's the phase that we're in now, making sure that all of those things are in place. Thank you. I believe that answers the question. And then the rest of the q and is just accolades. Um, just great jobs and hmm. so about you and your museum. Oh, wait, we got one more question. I'm told there is archival material at First Baptist Church. Is that true? Well, if it is, it's, um, you know, I hope there is, but um, I'm not aware of exactly what that is. I know a lot of the churches, like um, uh, the AME Church, St. Paul's has archival material, um, St. Benedict de Moor has archival material, so I would think that they would have archival material. We do have some things in our archives that are from some of their anniversary programs and things like that that were donated to the museum early on. And I think that's a part of what um, LCRA with the funds they're doing, uh, using to renovate, or not to renovate, but really to preserve some of these churches that really um, the structures, not the inside, but the exterior um, structures of these churches and will make those available at some point in the future when they do the new, um, streetscapes for Lincolnville, then people will be able to do like tours and go into um, the lobby areas of these churches and view some of those artifacts. And I think that's the plan that they have um, what they wanna do in Lincolnville with all of the churches. So there, we've got in our exhibit, I think we have like six historic churches that are over a hundred years old in this community. And um, I know at least um, three, four of them that are undergoing uh, pres or have or are undergoing um, historic preservation. Thank you. And I don't, I'm going to say this, I think we're done with questions, but I have one more for you that I think we're going to end it on. Everyone says, great job. But what is, for those who are hanging on, what is the one thing you hope everyone leaves with, but if that they didn't know before who visit your museum or visit this event? That Lincolnville history is an important part of American history that it covers. And I, when I say Lincolnville, I really mean St. Augustine history, La Florida history. It predates um, uh, a lot of American history, but American history is told from an English, um, Anglo-Saxon standpoint. And a lot of agencies acknowledge that it's the English version of that history. St. Augustine in Florida, a lot of their history was um, connected to the Spanish origin of the uh, European conquerors that came here. So the African history is totally entwined in that Spanish story of um, Florida from the conquistadors who came and uh, Juan Girardot who came with Ponce de Leon and all of those stories. So if you get nothing else, know that this is the oldest African-American history that's recorded in all of what is now America uh, or North America, the United States. And it is documented here. And those that's the story that I've been trying to get out for the last 
ever since I discovered it. <laughs> but now I'm not the first one to discover it, to discover it. But I, when I discovered it for me, it was just like, wow, this story needs to be told. And so I started telling it to everybody that would listen. And so I think people are listening and um, we're going to continue to work with the city as much as possible with, with the county, which does more in terms of marketing what happens here in St. Augustine uh, to tell that story. And um, what I didn't mention, I think did happen since I gave you guys my um, uh, resume was that I was appointed to the St. John's County Cultural um, Tourism Culture, um, Tourism Development Council. So my voice just got a little bit louder to tell that story. Thank you so much for your time. As you can tell, you are a very busy person and we appreciate you coming tonight and sharing a little bit about our local history, about the work y'all are doing, about your own story as well. Um, we couldn't have done our exhibit without you and for those who are still clinging on, thank you. Um, and if you haven't made it by campus at um, George A. Smathers Libraries, the exhibit is up through the 31st. Um, we will send you further information, some of these links. Um, I'm going to say on Monday, that's our, we're going to try. We're going to try to get you this info out soon. Thank you so much and have a great evening. Thank you. Bye.